So grab your Bible, open it up or turn it on. We're going to go to the first letter that Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church, Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And you'll remember, well, we're going to remind you what's in there, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is where we're going to go. And this is Thanksgiving weekend, is that right? Have you already started cooking? Some, no, no. Others have. Some have already started cooking because they love to engage with others on this time. I understand the government is saying don't get together, but uh, people are going to do what they're going to do anyway. So when you get together, do it in a way where God is in the center of it, where you honor Him, and we're sensitive to all the other things going around. It's a time for us to give thanks to the Lord. So if you have your Bibles, open to 1 Thessalonians 5. You know, it's good to bring your Bible so you can follow along. Chat, verse 16 in 1 Thessalonians 5. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you who belong to Jesus Christ. It's God's will for us to live giving thanks to him. It's his will that we would express that thanksgiving in our heart. But to express it, we have to first recognize that our God has done good things for us. And as we do, we can express that. You know, Paul wrote this scripture, and when he was writing it, it was his final instructions for the church in Thessalonica. And as he was writing to them, he was going through, and the church there in Thessal Thessal I can hardly say that, Thessalonica, was going through great trials. There was a lot happening at the time. There was persecution. There was a lot happening. Everybody had different opinions, somewhat like today. <laughs> but as he was giving them the word, he didn't consider the trials they were going through. He wasn't looking at the natural things. He was giving them the word that would give them the power and the strength to walk through the trials they were facing. And that word was, always be joyful. So that tells me that there must be a way even when circumstances come against us, even when situations rise up that we are unaware and hit us in the face and take us off guard, there must be a way for us to walk in joy, to never stop praying, to always be thankful. Where is your focus today? That's my question for you. What are you looking at? Many of you would remember Peter, the disciple. And they were out in the boat with Jesus, and the storm came up. Well, Jesus wasn't in the boat, but Jesus was coming to them. And the storm came up, and Jesus said, come. And Peter got out the boat, and he had his eyes on Jesus. And as the storm was still howling around and the waves were tossing, Peter walked on water. But the minute he took his eyes off of Jesus and he started looking at the storm, he started focusing on the waves. They overtook him and he started to sink. There is a key in where we keep our focus to have a heart of thanksgiving, to be able to be joyful and walk through life's circumstances with the power of God moving on our behalf. Regardless of the trials, always be joyful. Joyfulness is a choice that you and I get to make. We choose whether we are going to keep our eyes on the promises of God or we are going to keep our eyes on the circumstances of life. I can tell you that the circumstances of life, if you put your eyes there, will always take you under. But if you keep your eyes on the promises of God, it will always take you over. I don't know about you today, but I'd rather go over than under. 
Anybody else want to come with me? Yes, right. I tell you, God wants to move on our behalf. But he wants us to get back to the basis of what his word says. He wants us to stand upon the promises of God. Remember that old hymn? Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Okay, very, thank you, sister. I'm glad one person remembers it. Hallelujah. So we're going to learn to keep joyful. And then it said, never stop praying. That doesn't mean I walk around yelling at the top of my voice. It doesn't mean I interrupt people with my words. It means that I carry a heart of prayer everywhere I go in whatever I'm doing. And as those things face me, as I'm quietly praying in my innermost being, the power of God comes, the wisdom of God comes, the counsel of God comes, and it helps me to stay joyful, to stay grounded in what his word says. Philippians 4, 6. Many of you are familiar with these verses. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he has done. You see, whatever happens, a heart of thanksgiving will turn the circumstance. A heart of thankfulness, not for the circumstance, but that God is with me. So as circumstances come your way, what do you do? Do you look at them? And start figuring out what you should do. Or do you carry that heart of prayer? I said, Father, I don't know what to do. I feel like I'm falling apart. See, I've learned that God loves you, to be honest. Mm. It's okay to tell him you're falling apart. It's okay to tell him you don't have any answers. But then you say, Father, I thank you. Yeah. You hold the answer yeah. for me. You hold my life, Father. And Father, even though my emotions are falling apart, you are going to help me. You knit me together. And you hold me in your hands. And as you start to thank him, a strength starts to rise up in you. A joy starts to overtake the inside of you. Not a joy where it's like ha, 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 laughing. But there's a strength of joy that you know, that you know, that you know. That he is holding you. He is keeping you. And you don't have to worry. You may not understand. There's many things we will never understand. But I know he holds my tomorrow. Yes, amen. Amen. I know he holds my life. And if I can get my mind out the way and let my heart speak, his presence will move. And as his presence moves, everything changes. It may not take me out of the fiery furnace, but his presence will be in the furnace with me. You know, I love that story of the three Hebrew boys because it says, that when they came out of the furnace, they couldn't even smell the smoke on them. Have you ever been at a campfire? I've been at a campfire, and you know the smoke's blowing. And so I go to the other side, away from the smoke. But when I leave, you can still smell the smoke on my clothes. These guys were in a furnace of fire. It was getting hotter and hotter, so hot that the guards were dropping outside. But nothing happened to them Thank you, Lord. because the presence of God was with them. It was rising up in them. God wants us to be thankful and to give him glory for everything he has done. Wow. You know, many people think that uh, it's all about joy, and I think joy is critical for us to live today. Do you believe it? But joy is not always the, the commodity that comes to mind. It's not always the emotion that rises up. Yeah. So as, as Pastor Jill said, that's where we have to put, make a choice. What will I focus on? How will I choose? 
We think this is all about, you know, Jesus telling us stuff. But it happened long before this. This has been, this, this has been part of God's plan all the way from the beginning. I was thinking back into the Old Testament, back to a man named Moses. How many remember him? He started off in a, in a creek, right? He started off in a river, but got into a palace. And then he uh, took things in his own hands, and he lost out. And he ended up being a shepherd out in the backside of a desert for a long time. But God had a plan for him. And God's got a destiny for you today as well. It's connected to thanksgiving and rejoicing in God in the midst of the trials. Don't get caught in the trials and taking things into your own hands like Moses did. It took 40 years for him to get out of the problem he got himself into. But yet God never gave up on him. And God does not give up on you either. I want you to go in the Old Testament to the book of Deuteronomy, please. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, okay? Chapter 8. And we're going to read some story there. And the context is that this same Moses now has led the children of Israel, 600,000 men plus others, plus all their families. So, so probably two to three million people, plus all their cattle. And he's taken them from Egypt across the, the Red Sea, across there into a wilderness area, taking them across right to the very border of the promised land. And God said, go in, go in. And the people said, we are afraid. They were discouraged. They were not joyful. They had not been praying. They were not listening to God. Instead, they were looking at their circumstances. Fear had overtaken them. And they said, no, we're not going to go in now. In our generation, Everything is pumping up the fear of the day. I have people that will not come to church because of fear. I have people that don't want to go to a grocery store because of fear. People that have decided, no, they're going to work from home only because of fear. Fear is the devil's assignment to pull us away from God's will, my friends. So we say no to that. Instead, we focus on what God says. And God has spoken to us to do certain things. Let's go to Deuteronomy so I don't get uh, focused on something, something else. The first, uh, first verse, it says this. He's talking to the people, God's people, just like us. Be careful and obey all the commandments I am giving you today. Then you will live and multiply and you will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to give to you and your ancestors. How many want to experience the whole blessing that God has for them? One, two, three, four. Oh, a couple more at the back. Okay, guess what? There's qualifications. We need to do what God said. What, what did Paul say here? He said, rejoice evermore. Be joyful in everything. He said, pray without ceasing. Continue to pray. He said that we should give thanks. Those are commandments that we can tie into. And we don't have to go back to the Moses commandments. We can just take those today and focus on them. But you see, they had things they had to do. He said in verse 2, remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness these 40 years. So this was after they, they turned back 40 years. The whole generation had had to die out before they were ready to cooperate with God. You don't have to wait that long. Tell your neighbor, don't wait. <laughs> cooperate with God. Tell him, do, don't wait. Cooperate with God now. Do what God says now. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't say another day, but, but do it now. He said, yes, God humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by what? Every word that comes from the mouth of God. Is that still true today? Still true today. So can God teach us things while we're in the middle of trials? Yeah, we, we don't live by vaccine. We live by the faith of the Son of God. We don't live by, by washing our hands 17 times a day. We live by a faith of the Son of God. We wash our hands. We do other things. But we live by faith, not by sight. I'm trying to help us today so we understand the principles of God and the perspective of where we're living now. 
For all these 40 years, verse 4, your clothes didn't wear out and your feet didn't blister or swell. Think about it. Just as a parent disciplines a child, the Lord your God disciplines you for your own good. So obey the commandments of the Lord. When you go through challenges, do you get mad at God? Some people do. Instead, I find it better to examine myself and say, did I do what you told me to do, Lord? If I did, then I start to rejoice in God and I understand that he is on my side fighting for me and that I may still need to go through some trials here while I'm on planet earth, but he never leaves me, never forsakes me. He's right there with me. He's empowering me and the spirit of God is bringing the word of God back up inside of me so that I can overcome every obstacle. We are overcomers in this life, my friend. Is that right? That's who he's made us to be. But sometimes we get caught like them. and We don't want to do what God says. But he wants us to walk in his ways, fearing him. Verse 7. The Lord your God is bringing you into a good land of flowing streams, pools of water with fountains, springs gushing out in the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and grapevines and, and fig trees and pomegranates and, and olive oil and honey and new cars and all kinds of different things. You, you caught that wasn't in there. Okay. A land where food is plentiful, nothing is lacking. A land where iron is as common as stone and copper is abundant in the hills. Is this, is this what God wants for us? Does God truly want you blessed? Does he want us to live in a place of provision and perhaps even abundance? Is that where God wants us to live? It's actually where he wants us to live. But sometimes we can look at what we do not have instead of what we do have. I, I've, I counted up a couple weeks ago. I've been now in, in 65 nations around the world. And as I've traveled to different places, there's hardly any place that is as, uh, as, as wonderful as where we live now. The, the homes we live in, the, the cars we drive, the, the sanitation around us, the opportunities we have around us. There's very little in the world that measures up to where we are here. And yet, we can be discouraged and complaining here at what we don't have because it doesn't happen fast enough, because it's not quite as much as we want. Is that true? And yet in other places, listen to this, in other places, they're thanking God for what they do have. And I've seen kids playing with a rock, on a, a stick and a rock on the street and having so much fun in the dust and dirt of that street and they're laughing and they're having fun and they're enjoying themselves and they have, don't have a worry in the world. And their best toy is the rock. You see, it's not our situation that determines our joyfulness. It's not our situation that determines whether we're thankful to the Lord. It's where we put our focus. What, are we, what do we decide to do? It's the choices we make. Let me read a little bit more. When you've eaten your fill, verse 10, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land he's given you. When you've eaten your fill on Thanksgiving dinner, what will you do? Will you just pray before, Lord, sanctify this food? so that it uh, nourishes my body and I don't put any weight on. Is that the kind of prayer you pray? What do you say after your meal? Do you say, Lord, thank you so much for blessing us that we could have this meal today. I just praise you for you are good. Lord, you help me. You, you've, you've done it all for me. I, I give you praise for everything. Is that what we say? That's what he's asking us to say here in verse number 10. Be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land he's given you. But this is a time to be careful. When you're blessed, be careful. Tell your neighbor, be careful. Go ahead, tell, tell that one you're sitting by, be careful. What are we careful of? Be careful that you don't uh, become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God. Many people, even believers get so caught up in the blessing of God that they forget to bless God, to honor God, to put their focus on Him, to come back and give Him thanks, to live in a place of thanksgiving. This is, thanksgiving is not to be one day a year, my friends. 
Thanksgiving is every day that God gives us breath. It's us to give thanks to him for he is good and his mercy endures forever. We don't deserve it all. It's not like I deserve this. God's goodness is what brings it to us. His goodness is running after, running after us. Do not forget that he led you through the great and terrified wilderness with its poisonous snakes and scorpions, verse 15, where it was so hot and dry, he gave you water from the rock. He fed you with manna in the wilderness of food unknown. Wow, he did all this. So you would never say to yourself, I have achieved this wealth with my own strength. God's looking for us to humble ourselves. He's looking for us to rejoice in Him. He's looking for us to not just receive the blessing of God, but to live in a healthy manner while we are blessed. Why are we blessed? Because God is good. What is the purpose for the blessing upon our life? So that we can be a blessing to others around us. Is that right? We are blessed so that we can be a blessing to others around whether you're, in, whether you're in a school, a university, whether you're in a workplace, always look to see where can I be a blessing? What could I do? What needs to be done? Can I do it? Is, maybe I can't do it as good as somebody else, but maybe the somebody else isn't doing it. And me doing it adds value. Do you look at life that way? Or do you look with a mentality that says, that's not my job? That's somebody else's job. I'm doing my job, and I know that one's failing. Maybe they're not feeling well today. Or do you enter in and try to help those around you and be a blessing to them, those that are there? It's it's so easy to focus on what we've accomplished and rejoice in what we've done. Or even all all we've achieved in life, all we've accumulated in life, instead of looking at the other A word appreciation. Do we only appreciate God and then we expect appreciation from everyone else? Or do we appreciate those around us as well? Husbands and wives, appreciate your family. Appreciate one another. Express it. Is expressing thankfulness important? Is it important for the one who hears yeah, that you express thankfulness too? Like, Pastor Reed is such a blessing to, to so many here at BCF, but outside of BCF as well, because he likes to do things. He likes to help people. Nothing is too difficult for him. And so we can give thanks for him. Is that right? And then he is one that always gives thanks to others. Instead of just looking for it for ourselves, look at how you can express thanks, your thanks, thanksgiving to others. This is an interesting topic, isn't it? When I was considering it, I was thinking how these words out of Deuteronomy are so fitting for us. (laughs) I wrote down, do you have grateful habits or do you just have a grateful heart? If we have a grateful heart, it's good. Is it good to have an attitude of gratitude? Yeah. But you know what? If you don't express it, it does you no good. And it does no good to those around. Mm -hmm. So then we must be expressive in how we communicate with those around us. And God helps us to be able to do that. Yeah. And as God helps us, we have choices to make. You know, several years ago, uh, I announced that we were going to go to the Bronx and We were going to help people. And I had people here. I know they meant well. If you're here and you said it, I know you meant well. You were caring about me. But people said, well, you can't go there. You don't know what it's like there. You shouldn't take women there by yourself. But you see, I knew God had arranged it. And when God arranges something, we walk into it with faith, trusting him. And so we went to the Bronx. And there I met Pastor Diana for the first time. And I wanted to stay away from her. Because as I met her, I saw her heart 
was so open and giving. Her heart to share with the women was so much bigger than mine. And I had grown up learning how to give. I had been taught how to give from when I was young. I was taught as a young teenager to give your very best, not what you didn't want. I came home one day, and my best dress was hanging in the living room, a dress I had prayed for for months. And my mother told me that a family in the church had a fire, and we needed to help them. And they just happened to have a girl my size. And I'm looking at my dress, and my mom's not talking about the dress at all. But I'm sitting there looking at the dress and thinking, I prayed for that dress. God gave me that dress. And then my mother said, do you think you have something you can give them? And I said, well, mommy, I've got clothes that we can give. And she said, but what clothes? The dress is hanging there. So I said, well, you know, I have that green skirt. And she said, what do you want someone to give you? Do you want something they don't want anymore? Or would you rather have something that they love and mean something to them? So I learned from a young age, give your best. And then my mom said to me, if you give that dress, don't you expect me to go buy you a new one? When you give that, you're giving it from your heart. And you have to leave it with God. And you know, I gave that dress. And I was married. And I don't know how long we were married. Quite a few years. And someone came and gave me a blue velvet dress. And that was what I gave away. But you see, what I learned is God will always bless your life. If you will give the best you have. Now, that doesn't mean we've got clothes in our cupboard we don't wear anymore and they're good. We don't give them. But God wants us to give our best. He wants us to give from our heart. And I learned as we went to the Bronx that my heart needed to open up more. My heart needed to become more like Jesus and to learn to love those that didn't look like me, those that didn't act like me, those that had unfortunate circumstances in their life that had caused them to do things that I would never do. And that if I would love them and give out of my heart of love and gratitude for what Jesus has done for me, not about the circumstances of life because they didn't make the choices they should have made, but out of the love because Jesus saved me. He gave me his life. He gave me his power. He blessed my life so that I could be a blessing to others. And if I would do that, he would always take care of me. And I don't have to worry about where I'm going to live, what I'm going to drive, what I'm going to eat, that he will always provide for me. Because he is the great I am. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And he will take care of us. We are blessed in Canada. We are blessed with jobs that pay us. And we can buy things that are nice. But we don't get caught up in those things. But we get caught up in who he is. And what he's done for us. And because he's blessed me, I can bless others and maybe change their life for the kingdom of heaven. Oh, I get so excited because I know what God has done for me. I know he is a good, good God. And his goodness is running after me. His goodness is running after you. But some of you need to stop and let him catch you. Because he can't give you. You keep looking around. You keep wondering, why isn't it coming my way? I work so hard. I give. I do this. I do that. Stop talking about what you're doing. And start walking in his presence. Start giving out of your heart with a joyful heart. And let his presence overtake you. 
And then when you sing, his goodness is running after me. You sing it because you know that you know that you know that the goodness of God will help you. It will be there for you. It doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are. His goodness is running after you. And his goodness will overtake you if you will let him. So let the goodness of God overtake you in every area. Don't hold back and see what God will do for you. Did, did you catch that? Thanks. Giving. Two concepts in one word. Thanks. And then giving. Singers, do come. We give thanks to God. We thank those around us. But we're constantly looking for opportunities to listen to God, to give to others as well, to give out and bless. When I was reading those Old Testament uh, verses out of Deuteronomy, something struck me so clear that Jesus actually was speaking to us, and, and we live in a different time than they did then. They made wrong choices they, because they did not have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. We don't have to make those same choices, my friend. We can live above the circumstances that they were in the midst of because the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells inside of us as believers. He lives within us. He lives to empower us. He lives to put our focus. Spirit of God within us puts our attention on what God has already said so we can say, yes, amen. I will live this out. And He empowers us. You are empowered to live this life of thanksgiving. That's what He says. That's what I heard God say. You are empowered empowered to live a life of thanksgiving, regardless of what's going on around you. Instead of focusing on it, focus on what God has already said. Rise up higher and watch him help you. Can we sing that again? His goodness is running after us. Is that right? Running after us, chasing after us. He's going to catch you, my friend. He's going to catch you. Maybe you're watching today and you, you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. His goodness is running after you. The Bible says that, that uh, repentance is there because of the goodness of God. He gives that out of his goodness to bring us back so our life will turn around and we will walk with Jesus every day. Why don't you stand up? Maybe you're at home. Sing along with us. We believe God wants to minister to us even as we sing this song today. Your goodness. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Say your goodness, your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down i surrender now i give you everything say your goodness your goodness is running after it's running let's go home celebrating me. say your goodness your goodness is running yes after. it's running after me say your goodness your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Say your goodness. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. No music. Your goodness. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Shout it out. Your goodness. Your goodness is running after. It's running after I can't hear you. And say your goodness. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Say your goodness. It's running after me. Say your goodness. Your goodness is running after me. Your goodness is running after me. And say your goodness is running after. It's running after me. That's what he's doing. He's chasing after us. This is, this is for your hands. Let's lift our hands. Let's say, Lord. Just tell him, Lord, I surrender to you. You caught me, Lord. 
I surrender my life to you. It's your goodness, Lord, that draws me to you. I want to serve you all my days. Say it right out loud. I want to serve you all my days. Lord, I turn aside from the other distractions. And I turn my attention to you. And I give you thanks, Lord, for your goodness to me. Thank you, Lord, for helping me. Thank you, Lord, for healing me. Thank you, Lord, for changing me from the inside out. Lord, I receive your life. Help me to live in it every single day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Isn't Jesus good? Isn't he good? Praise God. Thank you so much for being with us today. I trust that the Word of God impacted your heart just the way it did mine. Remember, if you haven't subscribed yet, you can do that right now. And then tell a friend so they can join us and be online with us each week. If you'd like to help us be able to continue this ministry around the world, you can do so by clicking the link below. And I believe God's going to bless you as you bless many others. Have a great week. God bless you.